Today, I'm speaking with David Fitzgerald. David, thank you so much for joining me today. It is awesome to be here, Tim. Thanks so much for having me. I am so glad. It's, it's been a while. Yeah, we, we we did an interview before in August of 2020. So it's been a while. Wow, literally four years ago. Um, and I just I was just looking up the fact that you were actually my very first interview. That very, blows my mind. <laughs> you you, you <laughs> kicked you kicked this whole thing off. And I was <laughs> reflecting too that I remember when we went uh, off the recording part of it and we were wrapping up. At the end of that, I was feeling very jittery. I wasn't hadn't done enough thinking through the logistics and a lot of questions. I was just kind of doing my best, but winging it a little bit. And at the end of it, I remember when we we're off the air, you said, "Tim, you need to do this. You need to push. You need, you need to get this." It's a great eye concept and do it. You, you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. And I, I really was inspired by that. Yeah. Look at you now. Yeah. I thought you were rocked it right out of the park. So it's great to see that it's just growing by strength with strength. Well, That's thank awesome. you so much. I, and I'll, I'll have the link beneath this video for anyone that wants to check that video out. Um, the, the audio video quality is probably significantly less than what you'd expect at this point. But if you do want to kind of go down memory lane there and I, I imagine I had zero to five, subscribers at that point because no one knew i was brand new so literally you took me from like zero to five subscribers up to twenty one thousand and changed some what a crazy journey and just to kick us off with a quick bio for david uh david is an author a speaker and historical researcher Uh, he's known for his work on religious skepticism and the historical analysis of religious figures a lot about jesus uh, but you've kind of broadened the scope a little bit which we'll talk about very shortly uh in his first book nailed 10 christian myths and which i've got right here uh this is one of the first ones you did right uh, 10 Christian myths that show Jesus never existed at all. Um, that was published in 2010. So you've been at this for more than two decades now. Right. Yeah. It's, I got started in like 20, right around 2000, uh, mm. 2001, 1999, around that area. And I should say, I've been an atheist, a happy atheist for 16 years before it even crossed my mind to look into Jesus. It's like, it, 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 I never, it never crossed my mind that it might not have been a Jesus right. um, until I got curious about, oh, you know, when you read the four Gospels, we're getting four very different Jesuses. I wonder which one's giving us the real Jesus. Right. And trying to parse that out, here we are 20 plus years later. And it's like, yeah, I think there's a reason why they're also different. It's because they're making it up as they go along. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love, I want to get into too, the, the sort of the sense of the fact that there are patterns that you've picked up on that are not just within sure. Christianity, but outside of it. Um, but anyway, your your book and uh, that book and many others that you've written, they become a staple in the discussions on the topic of mythicism and the historical Jesus debate. Um, you do a lot of research. You do a lot of critical approaching to religious texts. You do some pr- provocative approaches to way, the way you do things. Uh, we love that. We help you help people reconsider their long held beliefs, which is very near and dear to my heart. You've focused a lot on mythology and the history of religion. Um, you're also a very engaging speaker. You've appeared at a lot of conferences. And events uh, that are dedicated to atheism, secularism, free thought. Uh, you share your insights. You encourage critical thinking about religious history and its impact on modern society. You may have seen David Fitzgerald in the documentary "Marketing the Messiah," which I highly encourage people to look at. I have a link for that beneath this video. Great, great work there. And in terms of his books, again, "Nailed" was the first one. Ten Christian myths that show Jesus never existed at all. Uh, Jesus, mything in action, volume one, one, two, and three. I love that title. Again, not missing in action, mything in action. Uh, the Mormons. And then you you also have some books that are uh, basically like sci-fi books, right? Uh, Tempest Fury, yeah. Time Shards, and Shatter War. And then yeah. the books we're going to get into here very shortly are your recent books. Uh, they're under the title Playing God, An Evolutionary History of World Religion. And there's three volumes. Volume one is about the evolution of God and the gods of monotheism. Volume two is about Judaism and Christianity. And volume three about Islam and the Eastern religions. So before we get into the nitty gritty of all of your amazing work, Tell us more about yourself. Oh my gosh. Wow. You've said so much already. What's left to sell? Um, well, it's great to see you, David. I, Have a great day. <laughs> take care. Well, thank you again for having me there. I'm I'm super jazzed about these new books, especially. And you're right. It, it has been building for the last 20 plus years from a guy just kicking the tires on the official story of Christianity and saying, you know what, whether whether the Jesus or not, whether Christianity is true or not, this stuff we've all been told about Christianity and the Gospels and Jesus, that's not true at all. And um, it's funny, that was in 2010, as you said. And the biggest surprise wasn't that Christians hated it. It's like, yeah, what else are they going to say? But how many atheists came on my case and said, oh, no, this is just like Holocaust denial. This is moon landing, no flat earther stuff. And it's just crazy. And so that's when I went back to the starting block and wrote Jesus Smithing in Action, not just saying why this 
in this, you know, these particular 10 things are not true, but this is where Christianity looks like it's come from. This is what, you know, the gospels have to say about Jesus. This is what outside the gospels in the New Testament has to say about Jesus. And this is what history outside of Christianity itself has to say about Jesus. And making the point that no matter how you slice it, the story of assuming that there was a real guy named Jesus there's nothing implausible about that. There's nothing impossible about that. But that is not where our evidence is pointing to. And increasingly, it looks like it's a completely other situation going on with that. Mm-hmm. And one of the side effects of looking into the historical Jesus thing is having Buddhists come up to me at conferences and said, hey, you know what's funny? We're having the same discussions in our circles to whether the Buddha exists or not. Having ex-Muslims come up to me at conferences and say, hey, you know what's funny? We're having the same debates in our circles on whether Muhammad existed or not. And like Buddha, I can see, but Muhammad, that blew my mind. It's like, now how can that possibly be true? And then they said, well, because this, 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 and this. And it was like, oh, I'm seeing the same things I see with Jesus. It's like his biography grows. And the further you go back, the less there is. And like, and and just step red flag after red flag after red flag. And so it really feels like this whole mythicism business, not that it's important, not that you have to be an atheist to be a mythicist or a mythicist to be an atheist, um, but it seems to be we're really onto something. It's not just for Christianity and Jesus, but all the big major re- world religions seem to be having the same exact patterns going on. Mm. It's wild. To is, me. It blows my mind. That is, it's mind boggling. And yet at the same time, it makes, it does make a lot of sense. It answers a lot of questions that otherwise don't add up. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot of things that have just been swept under the carpet um, by not just theologians, but, but uh, historians of religion. Um, and and again, these are not my ideas. Aren't, a lot of these aren't even new ideas. They're just taking all these things that have been swept under the carpet and saying, look at that. Look at this, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, you make your mind. Well, I, I do want to get in just a second. I want to get into to the books. I want to kind of dive into some of the uh, subtopics in there. Uh, you know, kind of just talk about the evolution of the, not of evolution of, of religion, but the evolution of these books. Uh, but yeah. just tell us, tell us something about yourself, quirky, hobby, something oh, fun. Gotcha. So uh, I lived in San Francisco for 30 years. And uh, I now, after, uh, just before the pandemic, we moved up to a place called Eureka in, uh, in Humboldt County, Bigfoot country. So now we live in this little seaside town with our, our eight cat, nine cats and a dog. And, um, uh, my wife and I, my wife is a former stunt woman and author um, uh, who was in the movie uh, Evil Dead 3, Army of Darkness, if you've ever seen that movie, uh, with mm. Bruce Campbell. She's one of the fighting deadites and the sword captain for that movie. Nice. Um, uh, and we, uh, yeah, we we sort of met through sword fighting and fencing, and here we are now. Um, and, uh, yeah. That's, that's yeah. awesome. You said nine, nine cats? Down to nine cats, yeah. Down to nine down. cats. Down to wow. Nine cats. wow! What would yeah, what would what would JD Vance say? <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of your books, um, yeah. Before you get into the, the, telling us about them, uh, the, the three new ones, just what what pro, what spurred you on? Like, what kicked this whole thing off in the first place? Besides the overall context of other books, what what made you not stop with those and and move on to these? Yeah, um, there's been some recent discoveries just within the last two or three years in both the Old Testament uh, origins and in the origins of Islam. And I was working on, I don't know if you've seen my talk, Sexy Violence, Violent Sex, The Weird Ass Morality of the Bible. Yes, that's that's a great, I'll I'll link that beneath this video too, a great talk. (laughs) Awesome. Um, It's, it's, yeah, Um, I've been wanting to get that book out forever. But um, once these things started coming out, and they were, they were, answering questions that I've always had about, you know, what's happening with this thing called the Elephantine Papyri? It's this 100-year collection of correspondence from these Jews who don't seem to know anything about Moses, anything about the Pentateuch, uh, the Exodus, none of that. Um, How do you have something like that in, you know, the 7th century, the 5th century uh, BCE? Um, And so I got so excited that these, these... uh, scholars like Russell Gamerkin um, and the archaeologist um, Jonathan Adler in Tel Aviv, um, at the same time, their findings got announced, and it's just been a bombshell about how we have no physical archaeological evidence for Judaism and the practices and rituals of Judaism as we know it before about you know the third or second century BCE, 
Meanwhile, Russell Gaberkin's coming out with a book. It says, yeah, it looks like the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they weren't the oldest books of the Bible. They're some of the newest books of the Bible, and they were written in about the year 272 or 273 BCE in Alexandria, Egypt. That's how well he can pinpoint the time and place with the arguments he makes. And it mm -hmm. blew my mind, just blew my mind, that basically everybody in the Old Testament we think of from, well, there's like three layers of bullshit that we get from the Old Testament. Um, there's outright myth, story of Noah, the story of Garden of Eden and the Tower of Babel. We get legends from everybody from Abraham all the way through the conquest and the exodus to the, the joint monarchy, the united monarchy of David and Solomon. None of that we have good historical evidence for. The evidence we have for the united monarchy, um, Israel Finkelstein famously said, it fits in a shoebox and none of it is a certain thing. None of it is uncontrovertible piece of material. It's all questionable and there's not that much of it. Um, and most people have no idea. Mind. And even most people have no idea. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I mean, this genie's not going back in the bottle. It's like this is just the beginning of this. Um, and it was the same thing with Adam and Eve and Moses 30 years ago. 30 years ago, everybody thought there was a Moses. Now, very quickly, that consensus has flipped in the other direction. Um, and even among religious scholars, they agree that there was no Moses, and there was no Exodus, and it's all symbolic. Um, mm. Some some dragging them by their, their their fingernails to admit that, and and a lot will never admit that. But nonetheless, it's not controversial anymore. So all those people who always talk about the consensus, well, what does the consensus say? Yeah, those consensuses have been shifting steadily, and not in the directions Christians like it to be. Yeah, and I'm always amazed too that you really have to take the word consensus with a grain of salt in the sense that what percentage of the consensus are evangelical Christians who are going to always, they're always going to say there's evidence. And I, I, I've i looked up even just, you know, for fun, go to YouTube and just say evidence for Moses, and you'll find all kinds of videos come up for Noah, yeah. for Moses, Moses, the flood, for all of it. And you're just like, you look there's at it. Great quote says, there's a great quote that says, every expedition that's gone in search of Noah's Ark has found it. <laughs> Exactly. And yet you do have to say, like, are these people really the kind of historians yeah. and quotes that we should be listening to when they've already come at it from the very start saying, I already know before I do any research, I know this is right. true. I know it's historical. Then they're like they're compelled to prove it in, in quotes Absolutely. because they have to or their faith falls apart. Yeah. And again, this is not a conspiracy theory. I'm not saying that there's some organizing, you know, cabal. It's just Christians being Christians. And it's amazing to me just how many of the, as you say, the, the consensus, you that instantly divides. If you get into a room of all the biblical scholars, instantly divides into religiously affiliated and secular scholars. And each one's Jesus debunks the other. It's like they both can't be true. So it's like when you hear someone and evangelicals love to say this that all historians agree there was a jesus it's like yeah they don't agree it was your jesus that's the thing and when you get all the secular historians and ask so who do you think jesus was and what he did boom that consensus breaks down instantly into all these different types all of them are plausible none of them are too ridiculous many of them are ridiculous but um they're all very convincing until you hear the next one and mm -hmm. that's part of the problem that we have so many possibilities and all of them tend to ignore the evidence that's not easy to explain on a historical Jesus. Yeah, agreed. I'm just just looking at um, your the second book in this um, in this series, which is about Christianity and Judaism. One of the questions I want to ask when you look at this is a question that's been on my mind a lot. And when you start, as many of us did, unfortunately, with uh, the Zeitgeist yeah. movie. Uh, you look at oh, like Christ no. and the Sun God stuff. You, you, yeah. you do you do kind of get clued in for the first time, perhaps in your entire life, at the idea that some of these stories may have been based on some kind of movement of the sun, or the stars, or the seasons, or, or astrology. Um, yeah. When you look at the fact that you're, we're, and we'll get into this shortly, but you're you're digging into patterns where people are making stuff up, but the patterns right. are similar, yeah. and a lot a lot of these patterns do end up having some significant parallels to things that they could have seen in, in, in the stars and in the seasons. Like, 
at what point do you think that any of this might have some similar patterns because they were actually uh, starting with astrology? Um, I used to be a little more on board with that, um, say, 10 years ago or so. For instance, the fact that there's 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, that seems very zodiacal, for lack of a better word for them. Um, but uh, again, Russell Gamerkin points out that the idea of having 12 tribes, that doesn't come into Judaism until Plato, until the Greek period. Right. Um, and it comes right out of Plato. He's the one who suggests having 12 tribes because then you every month you switch over the administrative duties from tribe to tribe. And he he's postulating this as like the perfect society, the perfect um, way to build a society. And all his ideas from those books wind up in the Old Testament as what, what was created in Judaism. Historically, no, that never happened. Um, historically, none of that is real. But after the Babylonian exile, when uh, the captives start going back into the Holy Land um, and you get, you know, Samaritans, Israelites and Judeans, um, they're rebooting. They're not even rebooting. They're re they're creating a history that never existed to make it seem like Yahweh was their God all along, right from the beginning. And all this other polytheism that they kept. You know, drifting into, yeah, there's a reason that they keep forgetting for some reason there was a God. It's because polytheism was the the standard religion for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Uh, mm. So just looking at, uh, I, I was going to say, I was going to jump into volume two, but uh, I should probably actually take us back to to let you introduce the whole thing. Volume one, you're, you're not zooming in on Christianity first. You're just talking about big picture stuff. Yeah. Like what, where did you start with this and what were some of the things that you were noticing in your research? Yeah. What got me on this current kick is there's been some really interesting books that have come out and scholarship that talks about the origins of religion. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of Robin Wright, his book, The Evolution of God, which talks about all the evolutionary stages that all world religion seems to have gone through. Um, does a really interesting job of that. That's why I named this first part of book one after that. Um, but Daniel Dennett has also written a great book called Breaking the Spell, where he talks about the evolutionary survival mechanisms and strategies that helped us as pre-humans um, just by virtue of being social animals. Uh, there's all these different survival mechanisms, mental tools, if you will, that are easily co-opted uh, into religion um, and into human society. Um, fascinating stuff, mind-blowing stuff. Um, and then I talk about uh, what I call the gods of monotheism, talking about how we tend to think of like, well, in caveman days, we worshipped everything, rocks and rivers and trees and stones and uh, you name it. Um, and then there, we had pantheons of gods, and then we had the one true God. And, and the real history, that the real history of that process seems to be they have this whole spectrum of everything from animism to henotheism, to monotry, to monotheism, to polytheism. And you can have all these things going on at once, even in the same country, even in the same period, in different parts of society. Um, and it's it's such a much, it's the, the zigzag it took for us to get from uh, ancient religion to our modern, mo largely monotheistic religions, is a really interesting evolutionary process. And so I talk about that. Can I ask with, um, with ancient I, Egypt, you know how they were mostly polytheistic, and then you have yeah. Akhenaten. Do you think that, that that one event made a big difference, or did they was that more of a blip on the radar? Well, having... it turned out to be a blip on the radar, but it, it had the potential to be the first monotheism. And uh, you know, we could have jump started monotheism a thousand years earlier. Um, as it was, what happened is there was another monotheism um in Persia called Zoroastrianism. And a lot of people have never heard of this religion. It still exists in tiny little fringes here and there, uh, mostly in Iran, but also in places like Armenia and, and other parts of the former Persian Empire. Um, and that religion has so much influence on Judaism, on Christianity, on Islam. All the whole Abrahamic traditions owe so much to Zoroastrianism. We really shouldn't call it Judeo-Christian. We should call it Zoroastro-Judeo-Christian. Nism, Islam, yeah, uh, yeah, tradition. For anyone that hasn't heard about Zoroastrianism, could you tell us a little bit, just a 
maybe uh, I'm sure you touched on it in your book, but just give us a little uh, glimpse of what we would get if we dug in with you in the book. Sure. Like what, what mean, is the big picture? Sure. Well, in, um, in a nutshell, it was the religion of the Persian empire when the Jews were in exile in Babylon and Assyria and Persia. Um, when they were serving under the Achaemenid Persian Empire, that was the religion that they um, encountered. And all these ideas in, that weren't there in Judaism before, like the idea of an afterlife, before that, they only thought everybody went to Sheol, this gloomy underground dwelling that you, everybody went to, whether you were good or evil, you all went down to this boring cave place for eternity, basically. Zoroastrianism gave them the idea of a afterlife and of a good God and an evil God. And you fought and chose sides and like good people would go to paradise. Paradise is a Persian word from Zoroastrianism. Um, bad ones would go to, uh, you know, this fiery hell or frozen hell, but you know, a really bad place. Um, and that's the first time we see that kind of division between, uh, uh, you know, a good afterlife and a bad afterlife. And there's all these other things like the idea of Adam and Eve, um, you name it. There's just the the borrowings just keep coming from Zoroastrianism, and a lot of historical um, religious historians they totally recognize this. It's not controversial at all. Christians have a harder time admitting it, but I've heard Christians try to tell me that like, oh no, see they got that idea from the 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 Persians, but it was just God's way of giving them information. They they thought it was like learning a new science or something. It's like, yeah, a new science that your God never bothered to tell you for hundreds and hundreds of years beforehand. Yeah, it kills me, the mental gymnastics they do to ex explain this. Yeah, it's amazing. I think, too, I heard that Zoroastrianism had that idea of like a, a, a true judgment, like that's, everything's going to get burnt yes. up and only the things that are good Absolutely. are going to last. Absolutely. I mean, there's some questions about when you talk about the apocalypse and all that. There's definitely similarities. It's just a question of those came later. So we're not sure if those were direct borrowings from Zoroastrianism or if Judaism and Christianity developed their eschatologies at the same time. Um, but yeah, totally undeniable. Yeah. When you look back at Egypt and then you yeah. try to you know go back a little bit further in history, like to Mesopotamia and whatever else we could could argue for historically, like how far could you trace back some of the origins of some of the patterns that you were seeing? Well, if you want me to get into specifics on actual characters in the Old Testament, you can definitely trace Moses back to Egypt and not just to just Egyptian mythology, though there are some tropes that do go back to Egyptian mythology, but even more so, the character Moses comes from a Greek uh, story about an Egyptian. And then uh, about a generation later, an Egyptian writes a history of Egypt and includes this character. And our Moses clearly is a reaction to that second Moses character who has nothing to do with our uh, Moses. It, 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 you know, it's obviously not the same guy. And yet they say, oh, no, it's the, they, they, the way they describe our Moses in the Old Testament. They're clearly reacting and in trying to improve on and, you know, blunt the criticisms of Jews uh, in that story. There, it's just, there's just no two ways about it. It's just point by point. You see how that's it's happening. Did and anything go back to you, Mesopotamia? Yeah, you thank you. Perfect segue. I was just going to say, talking about Noah's Ark, and you know, we all know that comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh. But what's really interesting, and this is something again, Russell Gamerkin, hat off to him, has discovered. Our version of those stories doesn't come from the original Babylonian mythology. It comes from this guy named Barosus writing in the, third, the fourth century BCE, um, because our story fits his story better than it does the originals. So you see the dependency on Barosus. You see the dependency on uh, an Egyptian historian named Manitho for Moses. Um, and, and, and the arguments for that are just so cogent and uh, amazing to me. He also makes the argument that um, he, he calls on the Elephantine papyri, this colony in Egypt of Jewish mercenaries that seems to know nothing about Judaism. It's because Judaism had not been invented yet. He makes that argument. Mm -hmm. um, Solomon, King Solomon, and his, I mean, you read the Bible and it makes it sound like he ran the whole world and the whole empire was giving all their money to him and, and just all these amazing things. 
We have no evidence for him whatsoever. And everything, everything that it describes about Solomon, they seem to be stealing from the Assyrians, from Shalmaneser II, um, point after point after point after point. We're re really talking about a different person altogether. Yeah, It's funny. It reminds me a little bit, uh, you know how with AI, AI couldn't exist in a vacuum. It has to be trained on models, you know? Yeah. So you expose it to art, you expose it to literature, and then it learns. And then, you know, you have humans that come in and clarify stuff, and then it retrain it how to train itself some more. And yeah. it's interesting how there's some parallels where it's almost like you see ancient or, you know, the Judaism that we kind of think have been thinking of this whole time as the, you know, the early stuff that was actually much later. But you yeah. realize it was training on a model. There was a model for it, and it was training on it. And then Christianity was training on a model. And it's almost that's like that, that, was, that was the old that's such a good analogy. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Too funny. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. but it's it, it helps, I think, to realize too that like when when you escape Christianity, which you know, my my channel is not as much about the academics as, for example, like Myth Vision uh, with Derek Lambert, who's doing amazing work, uh, knocking it out of the park every day. Um, but you know, when you look at some of these more practical experiences of people like me, who yeah. just said, "Yes, I did escape." Yes, there was some intellectual and academic stuff to it, but a lot of it was emotional. A lot of it was, yeah. um, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of religious trauma going through all this stuff, it's even to this day. But yeah. a lot of us, when we escape that, we kind of get past it. We do have this urge to say, now that I know that it's bullshit, what was it? Like, what the hell was I in? And right. yes, I can acknowledge generically I was in a cult. I can gener yeah. generically acknowledge I was in a manipulative system. Yeah. But like, let's be more specific. What the hell was I in? And then when you get into books like yours, you can like that th you were in something specific that evolved from something else that evolved from something else. And when you trace it and you finally get to a point where you can actually kind of feel like you're educated enough to hopefully have the humility to say, I, I, I know enough to know I don't know that much, but also yeah. to say, I know more than I used to. And I know yeah. where some of this stuff is probably evolving from. It yeah. helps you to realize like you were, you were part, yes, part of a system. And an oppressive one, but you were also part of an evolutionary chain of ideas. And you, you, it, it's, it's so nice to think too that you know that evolutionary chain of ideas is in some ways about people in power telling you as the as the layperson to just shut up yeah. and accept our our you know our, our message and do what you're told and give us 10% of your money while you're at it. But <laughs> yeah, I think to realize like we can escape and grab that mental autonomy, that thought autonomy for the first time and say, we were always told we're in judgment of this, you know, mythological God, but to say now we're not, we're not saying we're judging that God. We don't think he exists. What we're judging is we're judging these men, mostly men who were yeah. in charge, uh, dead men and, and some, some of them today, but we're yeah. judging these men in these systems and saying we're, we're pulling ourselves outside of the system and having a completely different vantage point than we've ever had. And that's, yeah. that's so empowering. I mean, do you, do you talk, do you feel like in some of your work, that it kind of mixes where you're like, you're kind of talking academically and, and informationally. And then it's like, oh my God, this is really emotional. Like this, this makes a big difference. It is. And it's like, I never had trauma growing up as a religious person. So the Baptist, I mean, I had an extended family. There were a lot of good things about it, but the fact that they told us lies and we believed them ultimately is what made me say, I guess can't do this anymore. It just, it just feels so fake. Um, and Seeing what you just described, the evolutionary process of all this, just admitting that Christianity or whatever religion you're you're involved with is a product of evolution, just like we are. Um, it's so exciting and fascinating to see the different evolutionary steps up the ladder it takes and the mutations it spawns and how it goes off in all these different directions and the good parts and the bad parts of it. Um, you know, there's beautiful things about it and there's horrific things about it. Um, and you see that throughout history being played over and over again. Um, I think I start out the book by saying that when you look at religions today, they all have their own language and their own music and their architecture and everything that is so their own contained universe. But when you zoom out and look at the big picture, they all look alike, and you can see how they're all connected to each other. East and religion and Western religion, which is something that blew my mind going as when I went through this process of uh, researching for this book. Mm. Yeah. When you when you do this work, do you ever feel like you're kind of both doing academics, but also helping free people's minds, helping people escape the matrix? As it yeah, absolutely. I'm. I do it because I'm fascinated by it, and I really love it. 
but and I love the fact that it, other people get excited about it just as much as I do because it's really cool to understand where these things came from and all the weird things that didn't make sense and your preachers try to you know wave their hands to explain it away it makes perfect sense when you realize this is an ongoing evolutionary process and most of this story is a fiction told as a you know a foundation myth uh and it's not true and this is what what we can know about the situation looks more like this over here um it's it's really amazing and fascinating and and there's something humbling about it and it 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 goes off so quickly into all these different countries. You see how we're related to to Sub-Saharan Africa, how we're linked to Persia, how we're linked to Asia. You know, all it just the the it just keeps the roots keep going deeper and deeper and further and farther apart. And uh, it really makes you appreciate these new ideas that keep coming in and changing things. And then they make it sound like, oh no, it's always been that way. No, it hasn't always been that way. Even even on the pages of our Bibles and our Torahs and our Qurans, you still see the footprints of the stuff that came before. Yeah, I was curious when when you're doing this research. One of the things that fascinates me, and I, I just want to pick your brain on this topic, uh, the whole shift from a matriarchal to a patriarchal religious emphasis. Like, what are some of the nuggets you've picked up along the way of like? Because there there used to be Ashra worship and there used to right. be other things and the, the certainly the other the, the the greek gods had tons of of female uh heroic cool. uh, demigods and gods goddesses and right. it's like now we're so ultra patriarchal what are some yeah. of the things you observed that maybe yeah. got us there well, it, when you read book one and book two uh volume one and volume two of, of the, the new series i get into what caused that flip from polytheism including um asherah and the consorts and and you name it um to a oh it's just one god and he's a boy you know um and and that that comes again that's one of the later uh developments in judaism one of the fun facts that comes out in the book is in the seventh century bce the number one archaeological finding from that period what's called the late monarchical period is goddess figurines in Judea and in Israel, it's like with by far it's the most common. Uh, with the, we have hundreds of them, yeah. Mm. So we we know for sure that uh, that the story we're getting is not uh, the full story. Why do you think it it switched from that? Why do you think it was just purely a power play by men, or do you think there was more to it I mean, than that? Ultimately, that's exactly what I think. Ultimately, it was just a power play, and. You know, as we've seen in, in Catholicism, you know, the Virgin Mother is still there and she's just got a different name. And, you know, uh, Isis and Horus, you know, you just change the clothes up oh, and you got uh, Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. Um, so we see, you know, history keeps rhyming uh, in that way. Um, but it is interesting that at one point, at, at some point, um, you see they're wanting to consolidate um religious power and part of the reason of that is like as you get as you go from small groups into large groups into multicultural groups and language groups as the empires get bigger and bigger rulers need a way to unite all their subjects who are different religions different languages different cultures and the way the easiest way to do that is to make your god not a god of the mountain not a god of the river but a god of everything that's above it all and transcendent and he's a god that loves everybody universally so we see this turn to give morals and rules to apply to everyone we see this this uh um the it, the us versus them group become all of us versus the evil people but you know anybody can be in this in group for the first time um that's an interesting evolutionary process and it it ultimately goes to monotheism. And it, mm. I don't think there's anything um, inexorable about it ha being a boy. You know, there's I, I talk about the the other gods besides Yahweh, who could have also been the one true God trademark, you know, um, and there was Aten in Egypt, of course. But there was also Asur, Asur, um, Asher in Assyria, Marduk in Babylon, um, Ahura Mazda in, in uh, Persia. Any of those guys also, and there were other ones in the Hindu uh, golden age, uh, Vishnu and Shiva could have also been the one true God that we're all worship around the world today. Yeah. Um, it Did just you mention so Mithras? 
Uh, uh, Mithra. Well, he was definitely a a savior god. And when we talk in about um, where Christianity came from, and in Jesus mything in action, I go very deep into this idea that what we think of as Christianity spun out of a Jewish version of these mystery faiths, like Mithra, like Isis, um, mm-hmm. you name it. Um, these rebooted savior gods um, that became personal gods. You know, that was a new sexy idea. It's, they're not just out there on Mount Olympus. They live in your heart. And, you know, when you die, you'll go with them. And all these things that sound just like evangelical Christianity today was going on in ancient Hellenistic world. One thing I, I have to ask, too, I, I, I love thinking about this because I, I admit I, I haven't done enough study on it. I want to. But just the idea that a lot of these religions, in addition to some of the other patterns that you might bring up, a lot of them were bringing in uh, drugs as part of their experience. Yeah. Did you uncover anything interesting as you're thinking through this or researching that made you wonder, like, if if some of the reasons that they're coming up with, I've you know, I made up this God is because right. they made it up because right. they're, they're actually like to them, they're seeing it, but they're yeah. seeing it because of psychedelics. And it's like exactly. some of these... Um, the patterns seem like there might be they might not be talked about as much because maybe some people take it too far but it seems yeah. like the more that i research it a little bit and, and I, I want to do a lot yeah. more that there may be something more to that and i've seen some articles about how they discovered some residue of this and that in ancient judea yes and it's like yes it makes you wonder and and honestly in the earlier stages of religion absolutely there's no question like shamans I mean, we know we know they took drugs. We know what drugs they took. We know what they saw when they took the drugs. That kind of thing. Um, yeah, there's no question of it. Uh, my friend Bryce Blankenagel, who's just a black belt in Mormonism, he um, has uncovered some interesting things that Joseph Smith may have dabbled with uh, that and other people in early Mormonism. There may have been some uh, hallucinogenic uh, undercurrents to uh, some of his his visions and things like that and and yeah there's no question that for many cultures uh drugs and hallucinogens were just part one of the toolbox for them to getting to speak to the gods and vice versa um you think yeah. there's any chance that early christianity started that way maybe i mean people have called it a mushroom cult um i'm more uh, concerned about the the things we can actually see the the, the literary links, if you will. Um, that's more on solid footing. But I mean, it would not surprise me at all if if every religion out there um, uh, has dabbled in that at some point or another. Um, mm. And but but as far as origins go, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. But so when we, we when certainly, okay. Sorry, yeah, what, whatever was driving the evolution, we can certainly trace out the evolution. That's what I'm yeah. saying. So whenever we say jokingly, what what were they smoking? We may mean, mean that more literally than we <laughs> meant to originally. Right, right, so yeah. When you look at at Judaism and Christianity's evolution, um, di- Christianity in some ways seems like so much of it seems ant- antithetical to Judaism, yeah. and especially when you look at the division between Paul and the Jerusalem Church, and you know James and so forth. It seems like. Paul is this huge enigma in this, in terms of the evolution of Christianity. Um, what do you understand? Like, who was Paul, and and what was his role in this? And and do you think there were various factions of Christianity, and Paul just overtook one of them? Was Bingo. do you think? Do you Bingo. think? And I know I'm making a guess here, so I'm, I don't. <laughs> no, I that's the one. That's the one. There was def- He was not the founder of Christianity, but he was definitely one of many, and he says as much in his letters. Um, his genuine letters, not to be confused with the fake letters that are forged in his name. Um, it's the interesting thing about Paul is, yeah, there's some people don't think there was a Paul. I definitely think there was a Paul. And for reasons I get into in, in volume two of this uh, book, um, we have good reason to think there was a Paul for the same reason we have good reason to think there was not a Jesus. Um, that said, about half of what we know about Paul and what everything we love about Paul comes from something that the guy we call Luke was writing about him. So there's lots of the, he's like half real. There's a lot of fake legendary Pauline stuff that he never tells us this. Nothing like that ever happened and could not happen. Um, everywhere there's an overlap between what Paul says and what Luke says Paul says. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a, there's a disconnect for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting, no matter what we think of Paul and early Christianity, it's really weird and very interesting that for this major chunk of early christianity he's the only one we have any writings of that's really weird to me 
Um, and I think that may have something to do with the fact that in the second century, Marcion, this huge heretic, was a big fan of Paul. Um, I suspect that in his own life, nobody knew Paul. He was just one more uh, of many, many Christian movements, uh, not exactly the, the most popular. Um, he had, doesn't like the guys who are running the Jerusalem uh, faction of Christianity, and he thinks they're fake Christians, which is hilarious when we think of them as Jesus's friends and family, and he thinks, you know, he doesn't give it to him for a minute. You know, he hates those guys. Um, and it's very interesting to see the way Christian writings before the Gospels talk about Jesus, like his letters, the book of Hebrews, um, any number of other things that never made it their cut into the Bible. But we have some traces of um, and the way people talk about Jesus after uh, the Gospels written, and specifically Mark was the first gospel. and. Uh, Matthew, Luke, John all came later and more or less reworked his stuff to uh, create cr correct Mark's mistakes <laughs> to improve on things they, they liked about it, uh, add their own thing, even though Luke and Matthew add completely incompatible nativity stories. Um, uh, yeah, and John doesn't even try to match up with the other guys. He's, he's doing his own thing. Um, and those are just the four that made the cut. We've got other gospels like the Gospel of Peter. That was far more cop popular than the Gospel of Mark, if we can judge by archaeology, um, and yet it never made the cut. And uh, we would not, we, we don't recognize the things that are in there as anything real or historical. Right, right. It's interesting too to think about how so many of the the ways that evolution, uh, sorry, that religion evolved, were based yeah. on very specific political events going on like when you look at the dead sea scrolls and the essenes and them yeah. wait, waiting for this you know the angels to come help them fight the romans and everybody else yeah. to take over you look at certainly the era of constantine and so many of these things like yes some of them hinged on the power of very specific uh you know uh, tribal elders or something but some yeah. of them is at some points in this really hinged on a religious political mix and or, yeah. or at least the anticipation of some of this stuff and the apocalypticism that was involved. And when you look at that, uh, do, do you have anything that shocked you as you kind of looked at how p politics and the and the people in power or the the actual wars that were anticipated or that happened may have shaped some of these things, especially when you look at just the whole Jerusalem destruction and this right. the whole Second Temple Judaism period? That just seems like this this huge. It's like people threw a whole bunch of. Uh, sticks a dynamite in, like lit the dynamite, <laughs> put him in this pot, and then all of a sudden it just yeah. went kaboom, and all yeah. kinds of shit happened. And it's like, whoa, like what? Where did this all start from? But when you look at the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all those communities out there in the desert, and you look at Pythagoreanism and how that may have evolved in, in the Egyptian stuff and the uh, all kind Alexandria, there's all these yeah. little th like pockets of people saying, this is how the, the, our God character is evolving. This is the real truth. And all of a sudden, yep. it just kind of gets mixed in. And then between like, you know, zero and 300, it just goes kaboom. And of course, Constantine kind of nails it shut and says, this is how it's going to end. But it's, cr and, it's politics are a big yeah. part of this. Yeah. And, and if Constantine had never done that, we would be talking about Mithra now, probably, or somebody else completely different. Um, yeah, because Christianity was socially invisible for centuries, for centuries until he picked up on it. Um, and it, mm -hmm. of course, it was his successors who really made it official but um yeah all, like you said all these stories keep happening and sometimes history twists and turns on very very tiny hinges um and i love it when we can actually see oh this right here from this guy's writing writing this here at this time is where we get this idea this and such you know uh philo of alexandria oh that's where we get the holy spirit that comes from this guy's writing here um, Moses, oh, that comes from this Babylonian guy or this Egyptian guy. And when you can actually put a name on the people we have to thank for these stories, it, it just puts a whole new spin on things because scriptures like to be anonymous. They like to either have a totally mythological name or no name. So it's just, it's not like Bob of Judea said this. No, it's, it's the Lord God said this and we have his writings right here. Um, when you can pin an actual person on it, it really brings it home in a way that um, that you wouldn't have otherwise. And again, yeah. it's fascinating to me. It's just fascinating to see the story of how these things came about. When you look at church, the early church fathers, 
it seemed like there was an interesting mix of some of them that were just very pious and they really loved this yeah. theology, but some of them seemed like they wanted to kind of start fighting if you disagree with them to the point where Absolutely. even up, up to Calvin, you know, you see even oh. in Calvin's day, he, you know, yeah. if you disagree with me, we're going to kill you. Um, yeah. how, how do you think Absolutely. that interplay worked with, with the mixture of the, the Christians, the Christian fathers of the church that just wanted to, they just wanted to love on God and love on the gospel <laughs> and others that were ready to start fighting. Yeah, you see, you see the whole spectrum. Um, Origen, the church father Origen, he basically says, oh, now, if you take this story literally, it's crazy. <laughs> but if you interpret it spiritually and allegorically and metaphorically, um, then it's this beautiful story of, you know, whatever it, it is, you know. Um, and it doesn't bother them at all that these, these stories of Jesus metaphor uh, historically they couldn't work at all because there are such beautiful metaphors for and this is how we, you know the the boat on the sea of galilee represents the life of the christian and this the storms of the troubles and it's like the fact that it could not happen as described does not bother them at all because they'll spend page after page talking about how beautiful it is and the deeper meaning that it has for us um and you to be honest you even see that now with christian historical writings where they say things like, oh, well, the book of Luke doesn't lend itself well to the historian, but for the theologian, it's a treasure trove of wonderfulness. It's like, wait, what did you just say? What did you just say? Um, they don't really care that it couldn't have happened. It didn't happen. That's not important. It's the beautiful message we get from these stories. But don't call it story because it's the Bible, so it really happened, and we all need to believe it. But they don't really believe it at the end of the day. That's the thing that kills me. One of the things that I, I love to think about, and I, I use this word a lot, at least in my own head, is post-mortem. Um, mm. You know, when we look at Christianity, a lot of us are digging deep into specific topics of the theology, especially in my channel, topics that hurt us, whether it's purity culture or God is looking in your head and judging you, you're born a sinner, original sin. But one of the things I think is really cool to do is to, once you escape, yeah, word I use all the time. Once you escape and you step back, and you and you're kind of done with the question of what was I stuck in, you know, why was I in love with my captor? Um, yeah. When you're kind of done with those those questions, it was very specific to Christianity, and and maybe this would apply to other religions too. But one of the cool things is to step a, a, a little bit broader. Like if you're at a thousand foot view at that point, go up ten thousand feet, and say what what does this just teach us about human nature? Yes. Like whether you're, even if you're looking at maybe Neanderthals, maybe Neanderthals would have yeah. been well, doing some similar things. Even pre-human, when we were just social animals, just primates. Yeah. yeah. Like um, what, are, what are some of the things you've picked up on that you say, like in terms of some of the bigger concepts of whether it's uh, control we talked about or, or guilt, uh, the se certainly sexual guilt is a big one. Um, the I, idea of men being in charge, um, the idea of, of sin, like where, where, why would we even bring up the concept of sin in our evolution? Um, right. certainly the idea of, of the, the, the rewards, if you're good and the punishment, if you're bad, that's kind of normal in humans. You see, you do see monkeys yeah. where the, yeah. you know, yeah. the monkey, the monkey parent will, will lack, fair play. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll lack their kid. And sometimes yep. they whack them pretty hard. And then other times you do see very loving things in, in the animal kingdom, but you know, with all these concepts of risk and reward, uh, punishment, and reward, uh, sin, sexuality, uh, shame. What, what are some of the things that you look back at this and say? wow, like, what does this tell us about human nature? Right, right. Well, it's funny because I kind of touch on this debate that goes on between religious anthropologists about whether it's completely exploitative or whether it's, no, it provides all these wonderful things for the believers. And I think my biggest takeaway from that debate back and forth is like, well, for the religions that survived and became world religions, they have to do both at the same time. They have to have the power and the patronage of a of a um, you know ultimate authority a, a secular authority and he's usually trying to bind diverse people under the same big tent um and it has to give the people something whether 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 it comes at a cost that's really not fair or whether it's could be better it has to give them something for them to hang a hat on um and if you can do both those things at the same time, you've got a good shot at a at a major religion, if not a world religion. Um, mm. Can I ask you, on that note, do you, 
you know, I've heard people say we, we need this. Like, even if they're not true, we need it. We need it to keep ourselves from like, if we didn't have this, you know, all the horrible crimes that you could think of would just escalate. We need this for morality. We need this for us. Like people need a sense that their lives matter for the, the existential, uh, you know, control uh, and so forth. The idea of fighting nihilism. If everybody goes to nihilism, then, uh, you know, why not rape everybody? Why not steal their stuff? It just all goes to hell really quickly. So you need some kind of control. You need some kind of opium for the masses. Uh, I mean, so the two, 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 one question, but two sides of it. Yeah. Do yeah. we need do we need mythology, and are we anywhere near ready for a truly secular world? Ooh, these are big questions. In my humble opinion, I think we are ready for a secular world. I think we've been moving towards a secular world for the last five hundred years or more. Um, do we need mythology? Yes. But as long as we recognize it as mythology, it's when we start indoctrinating kids to think that this mythology is history, this mythology is literal fact, that's when we get problems. Because there's beautiful truths to be had in mythology, just like there are in Winnie the Pooh and Lord of the Rings and you name it. Um, but when we conflate truth with these, with the, the reality behind these truths, that's when we run into trouble. It's like we have good reasons to be good that don't have anything to do with somebody in the sky telling us this is the rules to follow. Um, we we don't need bad reasons to be good when there are already good reasons to be good. Is what I would say. Well said. I wanted to, uh, if I could, I want to put you on the spot a little bit with a question that apologists would often go to. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the big things that comes up a lot, I heard, especially as a Christian, was that Christianity is is different. And I know that your your books are in many ways saying there's there's patterns that repeat. Yes, they repeat differently based on the society and the culture and the time and so forth and who's in charge and how it's evolved and the influences. But there's patterns that repeat. But one of the things that Christians would say quite a bit and quite strongly is every other religion says what you need to do for God. You bring him a sacrifice. You bring him your money, you bring him your children, whatever. You do things, you become a good person, even the you know, Protestant Catholic version, you know, you yeah. do good works. You don't just come in faith. And the Protestant, especially evangelical Protestantism, would say, We hang our hat on this one critical difference. You don't come to God with anything. You come, in fact, if you come to God with anything and say, Look, look what I did, you have disqualified yourself. You come as a beggar who says, I don't have anything to offer. I am completely wicked. I understand that the only way that I can have any righteousness is if you give it to me, if I am passive and you truly like, just like uh, the, the, the illustration was often given to us, especially in Calvinist circles of you're, you're not, you're not the person who's drowning in the ocean. You are the corpse at the bottom of the sea. You are dead and God regenerates you. He gives you even the faith to believe is a gift. It says that Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace you're saved through faith. And that is not a gift, for, not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. The faith to say, I believe in you, that itself is from God. And so you end up with this really big difference that Christians would emphasize and shove down your throat, to be honest, to say <laughs> we, we are different because our gospel truly is a gospel of grace, not works. Um, our gospel is a gospel where you, you do come as a beggar saying, I have nothing to offer. Please redeem me. Please be merciful to me, I, but I will not. I will not stand on my own merits. I will stand only on the merits of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on His death and resurrection, um, in my place. When you look at people saying that is different, that's way different. How would you respond to that based on what you know so far? Well, for one thing, that's pretty fucked up. It's pretty messed up to talk about how worthless we are and how oh god you are so big you know please sky daddy make us better and we'll we completely surrender to you um it's there's something just diabolical about that whole mindset that it in, tries to instill in kids and uh, uh it, yeah it's it's heinous it's just heinous and it goes hand in fist with the whole authoritarianism that you see in early um uh, stages of religion and we still see it in islam and and any number of other you know religious traditions um and, and yeah it's, that's not special that's not unique to you and it's nothing to be proud of that's what i would say do you happen to have any recollection of any other religions where they do offer more of a 
a passive, like God, God has to do this for you. It has to be grace. It can't be your works. Does anything come to mind? Well, I mean, any similarities? there's a absolute throw line between this and any number of cults that you can think of where it's like the person, the individual has to be surrendered and given up completely. And then it's filled with obedience to whatever you want to pour into that empty cup. Um, we see that East and Western religions. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think having comparative religion classes is so important is because when you see how much they all share in common, it's really hard to say, oh, but ours is the one true faith, you know, ignore all those ones that came before it and all the ones that influenced it and all the ones that are just like it in these other ways, you know, we're the, we're the, the only one. Yeah. And a, a parallel to that, I think, to the, that applies probably to a lot of situations is just the, the evolution, not just of the all the different religions, but even within our religion, because I think you could argue that if if the Christians say of 500 years ago that we're like, maybe you can consider them, they're the true bastion of like, we're truly adhering to the Bible and to Christianity. If they were to look at current Christians who would right. say the same words, they would be right. like, there's no way, like you all are so liberal and so progressive and so different compared to us. And if you, if you were to take it back 500 more years and 500 more years. Thank you. you Thank like, you. It, it yeah. keeps on they moving. Would, and you know, it does so funny because the, the more you keep jumping back in time, the less you recognize anything as this religion or that religion, they all, they all change dramatically because they're constantly evolving They're It's ironic that Christians don't believe in evolution because Christianity is evolution in action. It is it is evolving and mutating all the time. Yeah, um, I'm with you on uh, mythicism about ninety percent of the way. Uh, I'm very much there, and I, I I come at it from a different perspective, uh, but in some ways, but I I land at the same very similar outcome. Uh, yeah. But just just playing devil's advocate here, let's imagine for one minute that Jesus had been real, and if we could you know prove it in this imaginary yeah. thought, if he were real, and just 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 a guy. He lived, yeah. he preached some yep. stuff. Uh, yeah. He maybe was a zealot or something. And then he got crucified because he pissed off the wrong Roman governor. And they basically yeah. said to hell with you and crucify him. He's, he's gone. Yeah. But in his, in his life, his brief life, he did preach something. Um, yeah. if, he, if, we could have, if we could bring him back from the dead, resurrect him and yeah. interview him and show him what happened. Say, look, look what happened <laughs> in your name. <laughs> and if he, if, he could, if he could get past the whole Judaism thing and say, Okay, I agree. That's mythology too. I am now a sec. I'm secular Jesus. I admit it's yeah. all bullshit. But yeah. let me let me look at as the real historical Jesus. Let me look at what happened in my name. What do you yeah. think? What do you think would surprise him the most at what's happened? Well, the funny thing about scenarios like that is just even even postulating that there could have been a real Jesus, a kernel of truth at the beginning of it. Everything we know or think we know about that guy, Jesus of Nazareth, everything we know is based on these writings that have nothing to do with anybody who actually lived. So whether Christianity is true or not, whether Jesus was real or not, for all intents and purposes, we, there is no Jesus anymore because we have no idea what that guy would have been like. We can only guess according to all the other loser wannabe messiahs at that time, what they would have said. Um, but well, we put it this way, if, if if say the Gospel of Thomas what were more reflective of what he really said. Say 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 some of those things were his actual. If well, that was if that was close to it, what what do you think you would think? I get where you're going. Um, and again, it depends. Are we talking about the the Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, the Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, the Jesus in the Gospel of Peter, the Jesus in the Gospel? Fill in the blank. You know, um, it, there's so many Jesuses out there. Um, it's it's even hard to play that game. I, I keep resisting. It's like, well, you know, we keep thinking Jesus is one thing. No, Jesus, right out of the box, there was all these ways of uh, Jesus. And there were all these Christians saying, to, pointing to other Christians saying, you're not real Christians. Your Jesus is not the real Jesus. Your gospel is not the real gospel. Um, it, from the get-go, twas ever thus. So, um yeah, it, it it's it's very funny. I would love to have a time machine. That's that's what um, Jesus Mything in Action Volume Three is. If we had a time machine, and wanted to go back to the origins of Christianity, what would we find? Uh, that's probably the best answer to that question. Is is take a look through that book. Yeah. Um, 
because mm. the more you look, you, you chase that dragon, but you never quite can find it. You never can quite get to the one. Um, and there's reasons for that. Yeah. The one, the one thing I think that stands out to me, just again, just, just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. If there had been a guy and let's, let's just say for a sake of argument, he was a teacher. I think he'd be sh pretty shocked to find that people called him God. Like, I think he'd be like, um, no, I am a Jew <laughs> and I know there's a God and I'm not him. Yeah. I might, I might speak in his name in some sense, but I ain't him. Yeah. There is one God Yahweh and you can't, if no one, it says, you, no one can see his face sure. and live. So how can you see my face and live if I'm right. really God? And right. I think he'd be shocked at the whole divinity thing. Maybe so. I mean, definitely. Um, if, if there was one real Jesus, the first thing would happen is I would go out and write another book and say, oh, wait, I was all wrong about this mythicism thing. Now we've got new evidence and here's what it is. Um, and there are people out there who try to convince me, oh, no, there was definitely a Jesus. And it's like, really, though? Really, though? Tell me what you know and who told you that about Jesus. And when you look at it, the question that way, it becomes a lot more shaky really fast right out of the, the box. Um, mm -hmm. And again... It's not just Jesus. We have the same problem with Muhammad, same problem with Moses, same problem with Buddha. All these f characters, all these figures, all seem to be coming from the same place. Our imagination and, and our hopes and dreams and trying to invent a better world and uh, uh, putting a figure that said all these wise things and gave us all these wise teachings and put down these rules. It's really easy to do that when you can point to one single guy. Um, and I talk about other figures throughout history, like Robin Hood, like King Arthur, like uh, Santa Claus slash St. Nicholas. Um, you see the same thing. It's like it's irresistible. One of the things about being social animals, we have this irresistible sweet tooth for stories and fables and adventure stories. Um, and it's irresistible to to assign these things to a single character. Um Aesop, yeah. Solomon, Jesus. Um, you see him. I, I heard a wise thing. I guess Aesop said it. I heard a wise thing. I guess Solomon said it. You know, we see that throughout time and history too. Mm. Do you remember that movie Contact with uh, Jodie Foster? Yeah. The, there's that scene at the end of it where she uh, she finally gets to go on that trip through the with the the ball through the spinning circles, I, yeah. and everyone else on Earth just sees her drop for ten seconds, but she actually does go to this portal and she ends up yeah. seeing the alien, but the alien is in the image of her father um, yeah. to make it easier. But it's interesting. He he says something and I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, you know, you humans are capable of such beautiful dreams and such horrible nightmares. Yeah. And it's really interesting when you look at, at, at religion, you just think in terms of, again, a post-mortem, that is yeah. really true. That is real. And I was written by uh, Carl Sagan and yeah. I believe his wife joined in with that too. But, um, you know, you think about the way that we, are capable of such beautiful thoughts of the, the I mean, heaven, I, I know some people say heaven didn't sound so good, but a lot of people have <laughs> historically said heaven sounds great. And yeah. of course, he, everyone agrees hell uh, and even purgatory sounds hor horrible. But you think this stuff really does bring out, in some ways, the best and the worst of us. Uh, you could argue yeah. even just in terms of art, you know, Handel's Messiah is absolutely beautiful. But some of the implications of the theology woven into it are absolutely horrible. Yeah. And it, do, do you ever sit back and just think, like just of that interplay of the whole punishment reward, but also dreams and nightmares. Yeah. All the time, constantly. Um, just talking about, you know, all the beautiful things that come out of religion and all the horrible things uh, that come out of religion. There's a great quote says religion tends to make good people better and bad people worse. And uh, I I've always loved that. Cause that's, that's pretty much spot on for me. Mm. Yeah. Which cat, by the way, was that? And again, Oh, that is that was Riley. Riley, yeah, he's one of our boys. Yeah, we've had about three or four circling me at any given moment throughout this entire uh, they, entire. They, they're desperate for your attention. Well, I, I had another are. quick question that I wanted to ask to to go uh, just do a quick uh, overview of volume three, but uh, my question was going to be again looking at again at a post mortem. Yeah, when you look at a lot of the human histories that we're kind of doing these overviews of, yeah, one of the interesting anthropological questions you yeah. could say is how many people actually had the ability to do any research how many mm. people were even oh, literate for and sure so you'd say well a lot of these whole these these stories could have been seen as mythology not and, and yet real 
um, yeah. real to them, not just because mm-hmm. of people in power. Yes, that's part of it, but just that, that we were in a in a in a context where technology wasn't a real big deal. I mean, technology was how do I get my spear a little sharper? Um, yeah. But it's like when you think that most of the world for most of history has been illiterate, and you're cut off or you're you're in your little tribe and you don't know what's going on even a mile away, let alone ten miles away and a hundred miles away. You're not right. part of this whole discussion, this planetary discussion of what is truth, what is ultimate right. reality. And then you get to our modern age, where we've obviously got the internet, and you've got a lot of ways to communicate with people. And it's fascinating to think that even then, when you think this is going to be so much easier to determine what's truth, that you can have something that happened on the news, that everyone saw it. And within yeah. 10 seconds, there's 100 different opinions of what just happened that you just saw with on video. Right. Does that ever right. shock you to think yeah. about that? Like we've it come does. so far, but we haven't. It does. And the, the the ability of AI to do deep fakes and stuff is just going to make that worse and worse. And that's it's a, a problem we're going to have to deal with for sure. Um, but it's very interesting. In folklore, you expect there to be different versions of stories. So it's like when we look at religion as folklore, you know, it makes perfect sense. Hang on. That's my alarm telling me I get get ready for my podcast. <laughs> um that uh, you expect there to be differences and the differences it's, it's normal and it's natural when you're trying to write a infallible book that is right in every particular and, uh, and, uh, and devote your religion to it. It makes that a lot harder because that those are two very different processes, you know? And again, you can see all the foot fingerprints are still there from what the religion used to be. Um, they're all right there on the page. And some, some are hidden better than others, but, uh, one of the things I like doing in this book is like pointing out some of the ones like, well, when the Bible says this, what they're really talking about is this older thing here. And if that doesn't make sense, you know, from the Christian standpoint, it's because this didn't come from the Christian standpoint or the Jewish standpoint. It came from the Canaanite or the Mesopotamian or, you know, whichever yeah. one in, in, in particular. Mm. Yeah. It's fascinating. That feeling when a piece of the puzzle that you could never figure out slides in the place oh it's the best feeling just the best and that's what i love about these books yeah it's amazing stuff well uh could you wrap us up maybe uh or take us to wrap up with volume three islam and the yeah. eastern religions um i know enough uh, about islam to, to to have a starting place but eastern religions i'm certainly very shaky on what were some of the big things that you you learned about in studying those i think the biggest takeaway from studying the eastern religions and it's 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 very funny because i'm used to getting complaints from christians saying Oh, when he writes about Mormons, he's super dead on. Yeah, one, 10 out of 10, it's great. But when he writes about Jesus and being a myth, oh, oh, you know, they shake their hands. Well, the exact same thing just happened with me with a Buddhist talking about, oh, when he's talking about Islam, oh, 10 out of 10, fantastic. Talks about Buddhism, wait, no, oh, no, why didn't you use this guy's book? Why didn't you listen to this, you know? Uh, the, it's like a Mad Lib, only the Christians fill it out one way and the Buddhists fill it out another way, but they're using the exact same arguments. Uh, it just tickles me. Well, one, I guess one of the biggest takeaways was realizing, just seeing how connected the Western religions and the Eastern religions are through Zoroastrianism, coincidentally enough, and that part of Persia and northwestern India, this central Eurasian part of the world that we don't, you know, nobody thinks about much anymore. But that was a huge part of our all our current religions. It wasn't the earliest hotbed of religion, but it was like the mitochondrial eve of all our world religions. It was the the, the oldest common ancestor of all our big ticket religions. Um, and how much of other Eastern religions like, um, well, uh, you can break in the, the religions of China and the religions of India, but all of them seem to stem from Buddhism, which ultimately stemmed from Northwestern India uh, and has roots going back into Eurasia. But like Taoism, uh, Confucianism, all of these things actually seem to be spinoffs of Buddhism. And those figures are really knockoffs of the Buddha. Um, and that's kind of a secret in plain sight. Um, but uh, it blows me away that like Hinduism and Jainism, I expected those to be the oldest world religions that we have. And no, it seems like at least in the versions we have, they came from Vedic religion or Brahmic religion or early Buddhism. And these things were either reaction to or in response to Zoroastrianism. Um, and it's all like within 
that period of like 600 or so BCE to 200 or 100 uh, BCE, uh, you know, less than a thousand years of our history, this area that some historians like to call the axial age. And there's problems with that description, but that period seems to be spot on all this time when all these different empires are getting to the point where they need a unifying religion to hold their empires together. That's where we're getting our major Western religions, our major Eastern religions. Uh, fascinating stuff. Just really blows my mind. And we're just scratching the surface. It's like, these aren't like my closing arguments. These are my opening arguments for all this stuff. And yeah, we're, 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 it's, it's going to be fascinating to see what the next 50 years or so brings in religious studies. You know, that, um, that expression, the butterfly effect and the, the movies yeah. that spawned it. Yeah. The idea that something very, very small, yeah. a butterfly on one side creates a tsunami eventually on the other side. Yep. It, it's amazing to think about and reflect on how many things in history, if we could take that time machine back and know where to go, it's some of the yeah. smallest decisions by even one person at major at certain points. I was thinking like just say somebody decides to smoke a certain joint way back <laughs> right? in four thousand BC. <laughs> yeah. And he in his vision, he comes up with the Buddha. And yeah. uh, but it's it's just it's his little tribe. But then you know, maybe his great grandson, but you know, and that Buddhism becomes established there. His great grandson becomes wealthy enough to start building boats and decides to start traveling instead of going just yep. a mile away. He goes across the sea and spreads it, and it's just just the luck of the draw that it happened to work that way, and uh, the luck of the draw of how Constantine was 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 raised. Maybe if he'd been raised a little differently, it would have right. Mithraism. Raised if it raised differently, yep. he would have said to hell with it all. Who knows? But yep. all these little things that and, and and it helps you though. I think in addition to it just being an interesting, you know, uh, mental gymnastics thing to think through. It also helps you to realize, again, the idea of autonomy, that we have been hyper-controlled, not just by people and political things, but we've been controlled by just random events that some one person 4,000 years ago decided to do or pursue or whatever. Yeah. Somebody decided to take a walk instead of taking a walk, you know, <laughs> instead of his village, he took a walk over the mountain and everything yeah, changed. For, yeah, absolutely. Just, and the yeah, butterfly yeah, effect yeah. with religion is a big deal. And it's funny because I forget who said the quote, but um, it's quite a famous one that said, um, if all our religions disappeared tomorrow, they would never come back again. But if all our science disappeared tomorrow, eventually it, we, we would work our way back to it one way or the other, because that is our that is what's what's real in the world. The bedrock. Yeah. I think I heard Hitchens say it, but I don't know if he was quoting someone else. It might have been Hitchens, might have been Sagan, one of the but I'm sure somebody in the audience knows who, right off the bat who said that. Yeah. Um, when you look at some of the interplays, again, of uh, big picture stuff, it seems like a lot of religion, again, was like a butterfly effect of like random events. But there's also certain key points where it seems like a lot of it really is power plays like we talked about. And it does almost get you to a point of wondering if there were certain periods where, I mean, we, we know this, that there were certain periods where people got together, a whole bunch of men got together in a big room or a big castle and made important decisions for everybody that yeah. lasted for hundreds of years. Yep. Especially um, theologians. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And this, and, sure. and the, the early church fathers, of course, is probably the biggest one, these councils getting together, yeah. but you, you do, you do wonder, you know, exactly how this all came about in terms of the interplay of the individual conversations between, if there was a Paul and a Peter and a James, what were some of their individual little conversations and the arguments, these little groups, you know, what were the, Essenes like what were they talking about? What were the Valentinians talking about? What were this group talking about? And all these little things that may or may not have had huge impacts. And then you suddenly have these just just complete watershed moments where everything changed because of this group. Do you think that there was any sense at that time of the people in, in, in those? And this is again a lot of conjecture, I know, but I, I like playing these these you know story games and thinking what what could have happened. But do you think there were some people at that time who were Christians? at the time of the councils who were basically saying like what the hell christianity is all, like we've already been christians for 40 years and now you're going to come in and rewrite it for us as it were and force us to believe your way but we've already had a different way of believing in this in this jesus and just that idea that obviously at a certain point it's going to come down to the the, the edge of the sword you're going to yeah. you know turn turn or be killed but just that idea of of it feels like in some ways that there were people who, even though they couldn't have foreseen how big this was going to get in terms of worldwide yeah. stuff, that this was much more about politics than it was ever about religion. 
it was about controlling people, the opiate of the masses. Um, yeah. Do you think there's some ways in which some parts of Christianity truly had nothing to do with the religion and it was just pure politics? I just want to control the following, you know, the 50 mile radius in front of me. And if I do it, right. I get everybody to to agree to me that these are the books that we follow. And if yeah. those books include certain concepts, then everybody's yeah. pretty much going to be more willing to obey and do, do the things that I say. But, yep. you know, we know secret, we can chat at, at the top and say, you know, haha, these stupid people, they think it's all literal, that it's all metaphorical, but it, the end result is they obey. And right. yet we, we can sit at the top with our, you know, big sack, sacks of gold and laugh yeah. at them and say, you know, these suckers, but, you know, we win and they stop. And also they kind of have this fringe benefit of they stop killing each other because they think yeah. they're going to go to hell if they do. So we're kind of helping yeah. them, but we're kind of helping ourselves. You exactly. think some of it was, was much more political than we, we might have imagined? I think at every single stage of religion, as long as there's been such a thing as religion, it's just, as long as you got the first shaman who said, oh, yeah, I'll speak to the gods on your behalf, no, no problem. That's when trouble began. And when that guy becomes uh, allied with the leader of the tribe or becomes the leader of the tribe, you just see, boom, 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 this is like, you know, heroin. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, now we're cooking with gas. And uh, and you see it over and over and over again in every single religion, in every single religious tradition. You can see that. Um, and all the weird things that don't make sense make perfect sense when you realize, well, this is guys trying to control people, you know. And, and some do a better job of it. Some do a kinder job of it. But it's all ultimately about telling what, what to do because they think they know how things should be. And it helps if they're at the top of that little scheme. Uh, yeah. Well, could I ask, um, just maybe again, bring us to the wrap up. Could you address two different groups? Um, if you had a chance to speak to a fundamentalist, conservative, evangelical Christian uh, regarding, you know, especially these last three books, what would you want to say to them? And if you were to speak to someone who is deconstructing and deconverting, they're either at this point an agnostic or they're fully out. And they're just yeah. like, like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. There's no way this is anything more than mythology and legend. Um, what would you say to those two different groups in terms of what you would want them to either pick up from your books or just just think some some things to think through and say, you know, if if I could ask you to really med <laughs> meditate right. and right. you know really sit on this, what would you? It what feels would you say? like I talk to that second group all the time a lot. They're m some of my favorite people in the world. They they were like me. They were religious or they religion never took with them, but they're not. They're still trying to figure it all out. Those are the ones who love my books and read them. Um, the fundamentalists, the thing that bothered me so much about living in the Trump era is it, it really shows how there's a whole block of people who are completely fact. -proof. You can't tell them anything. They won't believe if they see the same thing with their own eyes, they'll put their own spin on it. And it's, and I don't waste my time with those people at all. If they want to believe what they believe, more power to them. If they want to tell somebody else, this is why we should believe it. Then I have things to say. And and I do. And they call in on shows like Atheist Experience. And I tell them why they're wrong about that. Um, and how it's so much more. It's so much worse than you think it is, Mr. Fundamentalist. Um, and, uh, and fortunately, fundamentalists are losing out. It doesn't feel like that now because we're here see, feeling that roar back. Um, but overall, Christianity is shrinking. And the problem we've had, and this is something that was really clear to me like 15, 20 years ago, and I forgot that I would was saying this, is that Christianity is shrinking, but it's shrinking by the most logical, compassionate, kind, outward thinking people. And so we're left with just the nutty, crunchy, fundamentalist, whack job center, um, completely fact proof. You can't talk to them, can't reason with them. They Only they can figure it out and they usually figure it out too late to do anything about it um uh, aka covid when they're dying of choking to death then they realize oh wait i was wrong maybe you know and then it's too late for them um so uh yeah i i, <laughs> I feel like i could go on this subject for a long time but yeah let's probably you should probably wrap it up there <laughs> yeah i hear you i hear you. um just wanted to ask too i know your book is not meant to be about uh about religious trauma, it's, it's academic. Mm -hmm. It's much yeah. more factual. It's it's interpreting history, um, putting pieces together. But I think an argument could be made that your books could, not just these three, but for sure these three, could help people a little bit on their journey to heal from religious trauma. 
if you I, agree at all with that, how do you how do you think it how do you think it could help in that journey? Yeah, and I absolutely agree, and I hope so. I hope it does because I think that's the reason I write them is because you were talking about it earlier. We want to make sense of this thing we were inculcated with as kids, and it's fascinating to see it. You the one thing you take away is like, oh, this is a human construction, and the story of how it came, and like the good things that came out of it and the bad things that come out of it. It's all an evolutionary process, you know, for good or bad. Um, and I find that very comforting. I find it really, I find it fascinating. Sometimes it kills. It just is hilarious. It's just so hilarious um, reading where some of this stuff comes from and how ridiculous it is to think this could have ever happened in real life. Uh, yeah, I, I trust and think and hope that people who are dealing with the trauma of religion will get a lot of comfort out of seeing where this all came from. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Agreed. It's interesting. One of the concepts that's coming up on my channel and others in the last year or two is the idea of realizing that the Yahweh character really is a psychopath. And yeah. uh, you know, not not original with me in any way, but I talk about it a lot and other people that come on my channel do. But I, I've used the illustration, like if, if you were to imagine a guy that's been courting a girl and so excited about the future and, and they're they're hoping to get engaged. And, you know, you maybe you're the cameraman, you know, he's hired you to to, to video this engagement. He's going to pop yeah. the question. Yeah. And you're you're sitting there and you're watching and videoing it. And he gets down on one knee and he pulls out the ring and he says, darling, I, I love you so much. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I want to love you in every which way I can. And she, he can tell she's about to say, yes, of course. <laughs> you. But before she does, he, he says a quick, quick caveat. Oh, yeah. Uh, and one more you, thing. Before you answer, um, think carefully because if you do happen to say no, <laughs> I have a, I have a baseball bat right here, and I will beat you to a bloody pulp. Um, and even after, if you do say yes, and if you marry me and you don't obey me, I will beat you to a bloody pulp. So, what's your answer? And he's you know not talking in a joking sense, like he's quite uh, right, right. that'd be a sick joke, but you know it, yeah. he's quite serious. Or uh, I've I've got gasoline and a fire uh, and a matches here. I'll I will burn you to death. Mm. You'd look at that person, if this was real, you'd say, you're a bloody psychopath and we're calling the cops. Yeah. And yet, when you look at the Yahweh character, everyone just gives them a free get out of jail free card. And it's like, how are yeah. we in love with this guy? He does. He says stuff like, if you don't obey me, I will curse you so bad that I will metaphorically, if not literally, lift up your skirts and show your nakedness to your enemies. I will make you so hungry that you will eat your children. Um, yeah. And it's just like, what did you just say to me? Like, you're the lover, you're the lover of my soul. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And again, it's because this is a mirror of what they think of as the ultimate power, this despot on the throne. That's all they knew back then about what the guys in charge. They didn't have this beautiful, loving model template, you know. And when they do, it was like, oh, the prince, like David, he was he wasn't a king, he was one of us. He was, you know, he loved us and fought for us and was a poet and uh yeah you see that both those that tension going on between oh no when you're all powerful you are you're the boss and what you said goes period you know back before zoroastrianism that's how they they justified um yeah there's a heaven god lives in there we don't live in there he lives in there that's for him we all go down to sheol when we're dead we have to obey him because he's our god and he's the boss you know that's as sophisticated as that got as far as carrot versus stick. Um, but yeah, and it helps, it helps shine a mirror on, on our own evolution, not just our religious evolution, but our political evolution. It's like politics and religion been hand to hand forever um, from a very early time on. Um, and when we help break that apart, we realize, no, these are just humans and humans, some are good, some are bad. And we have to deal with that. Um, but we can't put them on a pedestal. You know, the president is not your hero. The president is not your friend always. You know, uh, he needs to be held accountable. Yeah. Same with you, Supreme Court. I'm looking at you guys. Yeah. yeah exactly, think. especially these days. But I, I was going to reflect on one other thing you said. You talked about the idea that, you know, religion can really bring out the, the worst in people um, or yeah. something like that. And I, one of the things I say uh, is the idea that when you think monstrous thoughts long enough, they kind of turn you into a monster. And it's yeah. been one of the most fascinating postmortems to realize that people that would otherwise 
be, you know, and you could you could reflect on this in terms of the some of the you know good loving Germans in World War II that suddenly were willing to do horrific things to their neighbors in the name of their God. But yep. I just think people that are otherwise in their basic humanity and humanism and their evolved consciousness have some kind of moral compass. When when the God concept comes in, they're willing to believe horrific things, and even if they wouldn't do anything to somebody themselves, to say. I'm okay with my own child or my own spouse going to a burning pit forever and ever and ever. And I will say, praise God, his holiness has to, has to demand that punishment. And I will, yes, I will go to heaven. I will sing praises to this character, to this God. And while you burn forever. And it's like, yeah, you, you didn't, you didn't light the fire. You're not putting me in prison, but you're okay with that. You've yeah, kind of turned you're yourself complicit. In, you've yeah, complicit. into humanity. Yeah. There was a great movie several years back called The Rapture. And it came out around the same time as The Last Temptation of Christ, with evangelicals who were losing their mind over that movie. They really should have been protesting against the rapture. If you ever see it, get a chance to see it. It's It makes that argument. It's like, yeah, even if everything those guys who knock on your door on Saturday is true, this is why it's still bullshit. And this is why it just does not hold up. Hmm. Um, that same movie. That's awesome. I'll definitely look that up. Uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's still available. Have you, have you seen The Thief in the Night? Have you seen that one? You're... I grew up on Thief in the Night. Yes, oh, no. Absolutely. So you oh, have some religious oh, trauma. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, the rapture. Don't get me started there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so good to be done with that uh, that worldview. Well, um, I, I did want to just say, number one, of course, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for your, all the great work you do at the different conferences. And I'm sorry I couldn't be at Baja Con. I had some personal stuff that kept me there, but I would have loved to have shake your, shaken your hand. But well, I'll get there at some point. I'd be able to see you in person. And have a, have a pizza and a drink together. But um, I just want to say thank you so much for what you've been doing for the community with these books and all of your interviews. You're just doing you're doing great work, and we need people like you to kind of show us the path. You know, so be a, be a light into our feet and a light into our path, whatever that verse is. Uh, <laughs> just show show us the way. But you're you're giving us it's, it's it's amazing when you when you first escape Christianity, you know that there's more that you need to know, but you just you don't know necessarily where do I start. You're just lost. Yeah. yeah. And it's people people like you. Who I think you play such a pivotal role in that you say, I can help you start to understand what the better, like you haven't, you don't even know what questions to ask yet. Here's some really good questions to ask. Yeah. Then there you go. Read, read the books. And the, the questions that you ask, they, you know, it's, it's, it's not like everything stops with your books. Your books are in many ways a, a gateway to so many other topics, but you're also summarizing for those of us that kind of want to want a silver platter and say, we don't know how to ask <laughs> the right questions, yeah. but you kind of tell the lay people like myself, like these, this is what you need to be thinking about, and these these thoughts will change your life. And then, if you want to go further, there's there's more meat out there to dig into. Um, but I just sure. appreciate it so so much. You've been doing great work, and I appreciate your friendship. I know we haven't met in person again yet, but I'm going to do it before long. It's on the bucket list. <laughs> and um, thank you so much just for everything, and uh, I appreciate too just your willingness to stand your ground on mythicism. I know there's a lot of people kind of uh, putting it down and and saying it's 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 a it's a topic that we need to see differently. Um, I am again, like I said, I'm a, I'm a 90 percenter uh, at this point. <laughs> I'll get over the finish line eventually, probably. But I appreciate your willingness to to not take that uh, take the pressure that people say to just you know to end that discussion. The the mythicism yeah. discussion is important and needs to continue. And you're doing great work in that level too. So. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for everything you said. This has been real. That's very touching to me, and I appreciate it mostly. Um, mythicism is not going to go away. It's like if they prove it wrong. Let's hear it. <laughs> Let's hear it. But they just dismiss it. They harumph it. And it's like, dudes, that's not how you make this go away. You need to address it and uh, listen to what mythicists are really saying. And I don't agree with all mythicists out there. There's ones out there who are possibly mythicism. It's like, no, clearly that did not happen. This is not an invention of the Romans. This is not, uh, you know, uh, any number of other things that it could possibly be. Um, but I think we're getting a really good handle on where it really came from. And with these books, I'm hoping to show how widespread the phenomena is. And um, again, it's it's exciting for me, and I'm happy to do it. And I'm really happy to hear you say that it, it's a it's a benefit to you and and other people. And uh, it really is what keeps me going. So, Absolutely, hundred percent. Well, um, I'll have all the links beneath this video for your Amazon page. Uh, again, the recent books for those of you that have already been following David's work, and maybe even have some of his earlier books. Uh, don't forget to ch uh, check out and pick up the new ones. Again, uh, three parts. Uh, under the title, Playing God, an Evolutionary History of World Religion. Uh, so please go pick those up. 
and uh, you know, like and subscribe to everything you can that he's involved in. Uh, but David, thank you so much. Look forward to uh, the next books, uh, whatever's coming next. Who knows? Who knows what's coming next? Maybe you'll be de uh, dealing with the mythicism of Donald Trump before long. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyway, thank you so much. Great to hear you again. Thank you so much too. Again, I'll just wrap up where we started. Thank you for being part of the early history of the, ch the channel too. Launching me, literally being video number one. Uh, that that's a that's a you know it's a big big place for me in my mind. It's a placeholder. So thank you so much for just helping me uh, to get started four years ago. And I uh, look forward to it. Let, let's do it again before four more years pass. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure, Tim. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, David. Okay. Bye.